All right, all right, all right. How's it going, you guys? I'm going to go ahead and kick this thing off now, and people can just join us later. Um, this will be available on my channel after this live stream is over, and you guys can go back and check the uh, video to see whatever you missed and um, to rewatch certain parts if you miss something or just want to go in and pause. Um, so yeah, I'm September and this is my Henna 101 class. I specifically designed this for some local folks who um, bought henna kits that I made for our little quarantine. Um, so the last few days people have been picking them up from my porch and they will be making the kits along with me um, during this live stream and um, should be a lot of fun. I'm going to try to teach you guys about henna and how it works and best practices. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of information, I think. Um, and some of this will be pre-recorded and some of it will be live like right now. Um, and uh, that's just to help me kind of focus on you guys and making sure everything flows. This is a bit more complicated than my usual stream where I usually just um, am sitting at a table painting and I'll switch to a coffee break scene. And um, so I have a lot of slides to show you guys and a few pre-recorded videos of actually mixing the henna. Um, so yeah, um, I hope you'll just use this time to learn something new, to relax, to take care of yourself. It's a very stressful time out there. So section this time off away from your phone and from distractions and let's just learn something fun a new skill, a new art form. Yeah, let's have a good time. So I'm going to start off um, telling you a little bit about henna and how it works, and then I will cover what is in the kits and what is usually in a recipe if you did not get one of my kits. Um, and then we'll go into, I'll actually show you how I do it and give you some application tips as well um, to create your designs. So you're in for a treat. I hope it's fun on your end. It was fun on my end, learning all this new stuff, um, all this new software to show you this, because usually I do this in a classroom. Um, so thanks for coming. It's really awesome that you guys are here, and it's really awesome when y'all support local art. Um, yeah, it means a lot to me. Thank you. So to kick it off, let's talk about what henna is. So the henna that I am talking about is natural henna, and it comes from a plant. So it really is very natural. Um, if you look at the henna powder in your kit, you will notice it is very green in color. That's because it's a plant substance um, and it's very fresh. When you're looking for henna powder for body quality, you want it to be very finely sifted like what I have given you. Um, there is some rougher henna out there, um, some powder that you can use on your hair. It still has leaves and sticks in it. Totally works for hair won't really work for skin and that's because the application tool we're going to use is called a henna cone and it's like an icing bag but a very small one and the tip of it is very fine and small so you can't really push anything very large through that hole um, so really finely sifted powder is important so that you can really sh let your artistry shine um, while using this tool so I'm going to show you guys all about henna cones later um, but let's talk about, too, the areas in green on the map are where henna grows. Um, these are a lot of the countries that have thousands of years of history traditions. Um, Africa, India, Egypt. Um, there are so many different cultural and religious um, traditions throughout all of those areas um, based around this plant. And this plant has diffused into other cultures for other purposes um, and a lot of appreciation has really um, been rejuvenated for this natural substance and the artistry behind it and all of the history attached to it. So I hope that you will take this opportunity to kind of um, wet your whistle, but go dive deeper and learn a little bit more about it. I think it's infinitely fascinating. Um, I've been studying henna for, this is my seventh year, and I feel like I'm still learning new stuff. So definitely dig in and uh, see if you can learn something new beyond what I teach you today. Um, 
So yeah, so that's what it is and where it grows. People use it to still do traditional practices um, like Indian bridal mindy. Um, people also use it to try out tattoo ideas. You'll have a little bit of both represented throughout the world. Um, some tattoos are like the one on the left, a little bit more like an actual, or I'm sorry, some henna designs are like tattoos, like the one on the left. And then you'll see more traditional designs like the mandala on the right. Um, and that's more what you usually see with traditional henna. Um, but again, it has diffused into many, many cultures. And um, it's really amazing how different places put the same elements together different ways. Um, yeah, some of the cultures that actually have used it, have used it for different reasons. Um, again, it's got a very lengthy history, um, henna the plant and as a, an art form, um, but it also has healing qualities to it, which means that in some places it has been used as a healing substance, um, like in Africa, it's been used to mark bodies um, in traditional ways. In Egypt, ancient Egypt, um, it was found to be used for hair dye, as well as the original nail polish. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool with hair and nails, henna, the dye molecule in henna will fuse to the keratin. And so if you dye your hair with henna, you will have to grow it out. It will not fade out. Um, and the same if you stain your nails with henna, you'll have to grow them out to get rid of that stain. So pretty interesting. Um, and then, of course, in India, even modern-day brides are still covered in henna tattoos um, or henna designs. Sorry, Mindy is actually the correct term um, for the art stylings that come out of those Asian countries um, and that area. Um, and it is really intricate work and just beautiful. Again, I encourage you to reach beyond what I show you today and just dig into that realm because there is just so much inspiring art out there. Um, but yeah, let's talk about real quick some of the questions I get about sensitivities when con it concerns natural henna. Um, natural henna is typically considered safe for everyone, generally, but it is not necessarily recommended for children under five, um, and some artists cut it off at seven and above, um, and that's just because there is a very rare reaction that is linked to essential oils in very young children. And I think there's just not quite enough knowledge ability about how that affects them long term. So I think it's just something that's more of like a, a matter of um, being cautious. Um, plus, it is very difficult to ask a five year old or under to sit still for the length of their henna tattoo as well as um, then sitting still for another 15 or 20 minutes while it dries. Um, so that's usually the, the age restriction that people ask me about. It's generally just being cautious. But if a child has been exposed to essential oils already at that age, um, then it's really down to the parents. But again, in some cases, artists just won't henna anybody that age. Um, and it's really just better to be cautious. Again, with henna, it's, it's generally accepted as being very safe for everyone, but there is a very rare portion of the population that is allergic to either the henna plant itself, just general plant allergies. Um, and I have met some people who are allergic to some of the essential oils, um, someone who is allergic to tea tree, as well as a couple of people who are allergic to lavender oil. So again, just proceed with caution. If you have not ever used henna before, if you have not ever used essential oils, I definitely recommend doing a spot test um, and trying it out to make sure that you don't have any sensitivities or itchiness. If you do, then just wash it off with soap and water and you should be totally fine. Um, and again, another question that I get is about skin tones and natural henna. Um, henna will stain any skin tone and it's a transparent stain. So it actually sits on top of whatever coloration is underneath it. So if you have paler skin, you will get a more high contrast stain. Um, and if you have darker skin, you will get a much deeper, richer coloration of your stain. So it's really cool to watch it develop on different skin types and colorations, um, just for the mere fact that it's individual to each person and their skin. So that's kind of the rundown on the basics of henna. Um, you guys can uh, feel free to ask me questions towards the end. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing the contents or the comments on my channel right now. Um, 
I tried to put up a couple and they're still not coming through. So there might be a lag or I might just need to check the original stream. Um, but I will try to open this up to questions at some point um, if there's anything I was unclear on. So I do want to cover now what is in your kit. For those of you who got a kit from me, let's see. Oop. There we go. So on the left, on the top here, is what is in your henna kit. So what I gave you is basically half of the usual recipe that I do when I do classes at libraries. Um, the full recipe is down below it. Um, it's basically just what I've given you but doubled. Um, I actually gave you guys a little bit more of the essential oil blend to help with the stain um, and a little bit too much sugar. Um, but that's just in case sometimes the humidity can affect henna um, and how sticky or not sticky it is. So I gave you more than enough sugar to make sure that you have enough. Um, inside your kit, you'll also have um, the henna powder, which is a blend of my two favorites, Jamila and Raj. Jamila is a more creamy henna powder when it's mixed, and Raj is more stringy. So it's really great for laying down straight lines, um, which I'll show you guys how to do that, um, some tips and tricks later. Um, carrot bag is just a giant triangular icing bag, basically. They use these at um, bakeries and um, to draw designs on cakes. So very similar. And the henna cones are just a smaller version of that. Um, and I also will show you guys a video of me rolling henna cones at the end of this stream. Um, there's a straining sock in there. Just a stocking works fine. Um, if you want a longer one and have some old pantyhose, laying around, you can cut those up and use those to strain as well. But what I gave you should be sufficient for the amount of henna mix that you have. Um, and then let's see, you have instructions in there. I gave you a basic rundown, but I'm gonna go over each part of the instructions for you guys in this video. Um, so yeah, and then down below, again, just the typical formula. If you did not get a henna kit from me or you want to order from somebody, I do believe I have it linked in the description below this video. Um, the company that I use for my supplier, uh, hennacaravan.com. I love them. They have so many different things available. They have kits, they have bulk um, powder, they have um, some other body art available. Um, they're just a great company. So definitely check them out. I'll try to put a link below so you can click there if you want to get better henna kits than mine. Mine are pretty amateur, but I think they work for our little quarantine situation. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm going to go ahead and play this video for you guys. This is me just unpacking your kit and showing you how to um, mix up the henna. And this will be right before we set it to the side. Um, I did try to send out a note, and it's included in the instructions, that there, it does take six hours at least for your henna to develop and be ready to apply to your skin. So once you mix it, um, like in this first video, you're going to want to cover it and set it to the side for six hours. And then you can always join us later for the other portion of that, six hours after the henna has been mixed. Um, or you can just set it to the side and continue to watch. Um, and just learn and then later you can just sit down and do it without having to pull the video back up but um, Yeah, so I'm gonna turn the sound down and let this play and then I'll be back to show you what kind of henna um, Texture we're really looking for here um, In the second part so enjoy All right, you guys let's get into these kits so most of you have picked up kits from me locally. Um, if you don't have a kit but are joining us, this will still work for um, if you get a kit later. Just kind of the rundown of the mixing and straining and coning your henna. Um, so in my kit, I've given you guys um, some henna powder and uh, some sugar. Too much sugar, actually. I'm going to show you guys kind of how much I use. Um, essential oils. This is a blend of kajaput, orange, and lemongrass. Um, and everybody except for Kat got a little bit of lavender in theirs as well um, to kind of help deepen the stain a little bit. Always want to be mindful of allergies in essential oils. Um, and if you haven't 
tried henna or essential oils on yourself before, maybe a spot test is a good idea, just to be sure that there's no itching or redness that occurs. Everything here is natural and safe, and um, it is very rare that somebody has a reaction, but caution is always the best practice. So we're going to move everything to the side that we don't need right now, and we'll kick it off with the essential oils and the henna powder and the sugar. So grab a bowl and your instructions. If you need them, if you don't, no big deal. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but I'm going to walk you through it anyway. Um, basically dry ingredients first and then wet ingredients, just like baking. We'll start with the henna powder. This is really finely sifted, so be careful not to inhale this. Um, you'll also want to be careful when you are stirring your mixture because it can kick up the dust and um, it not only gets messy, but yeah, you don't want to inhale it. Um, then I use the sugar and I'm going to use about half of this pack. So this is two tablespoons. I'm using about one tablespoon to start. I'm going to see how sticky my henna ends up on the other side. Sometimes it depends on what the humidity is like. And um, then I'm pouring in the entire bottle of essential oils. This is just slightly more essential oils than you usually use for this much powder. But again, it should help with a nice dark stain. A little bit of water is needed just to get everything kind of flowing and get all the ingredients mixed together. You definitely don't want to overdo it on the water. So do pour carefully and only use small splashes at a time. Once you put in a little bit of water, go ahead and stir it up and start to get all those ingredients mashed together a bit. Should start to smell really good right about now. Okay, one way you can actually tell good henna from the um, chemically corrupted henna is it smells very earthy. It smells like a plant. It smells like oils. Um, the stuff that is really dangerous for your skin usually smells like hair dye or the gas station. Um, so this is definitely the smell of good henna. Um, and as you can see, I'm getting a little bit more water in there. It's getting a little bit um, more wet. Still want it closer to a mashed potato sort of consistency. Again, never getting too wet. But decently slimy is what we're going for. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty crazy. <laughs> kind of gross. <laughs> it's going to do some lovely things, though. All right, so that is about the consistency that you want um, before you set your henna to the side. If yours was drier than this or wetter than this, no big deal. Um, I'm going to show you the flip side of this and show you what your henna needs to look like um, before we start to strain it. So grab something plastic. You'll want to cover this just a little bit. I grab like a sandwich bag usually, um, and I just kind of set it down over on top of the henna. Just holds in the moisture a little bit and um, keeps it wet so that it's nice and ready to go in six hours. Um, sometimes I'll leave it overnight, so that just keeps it from drying out. All right, so I'm hoping that did not cut off too soon. Um, but yeah, this is a picture of perfect henna paste. This is after six hours from where we just left off. Um, this is, I actually did mix this with a hand mixer and you guys can totally use a hand mixer. Um, I recommend waiting until it's been six hours until the dye has released from the henna powder um, in a process called terping, which I'll go over towards the end. Um, and this is um, this is about what you're aiming for as far as creaminess goes. Um, we're gonna want it thin enough to go through the stocking because the stocking is what we'll use to strain all the clumps out of our henna. 
Um, so we do want to get it as wet as possible, but do be careful not to overwater it. Uh, again, this can be kind of tragic if we add too much water. Um, the henna is a bit more runny and less workable. Um, so add water slowly, but um, for now, just set that henna to the side. Um, if you've already set your henna to the side and did this six hours ago or did this yesterday and you're ready for the next step, it's coming up. Um, just, uh, sorry, checking my notes um, to make sure that I have covered everything. Um, again, this production is a little bit more intense than my usual um, videos. All right, so um, again, if you need to, you can take a break at this point or um, and come back later. This video will be on my channel. Um, and I think I'll probably leave it up for at least a couple of weeks for you guys because people are still picking up the kits that they've got. They weren't able to join us today. So um, you should be able to check back and um, you can always hit me up or message me if you have more questions. Um, but yeah, so for now we're going to go ahead and forge on with the video of six hours later. So you're going to see consistency of henna paste here. Um, we're going to uh, strain the clumps out. I'm going to show you guys how to use the carrot bag and the stocking. And then I'm going to show you how to fill the henna cones. Um, and I'm going to tape one down for you um, in this pre-recorded video. After that, I'm going to turn the mic back on and show you just a few more cones being taped and testing the tips. And then we'll go through application of henna. Um, so it's, it's going to get fun, I promise. Um, but yeah, six hours after we've mixed the paste, um, this is where we left off. All right, so it has been six hours since we set our henna to the side. Ooh, so sticky. Yeah, that's why we like to keep the plastic on there. Um, that just helps it keep nice and wet. If you didn't put plastic on top, it's really not a big deal, but you'll have some like darker hardened top to your henna mix when you come back to it. No big deal. Add water, just a sploosh. Um, and instead of mixing right away, if it's hard on the top or hard in areas, just let it sit for about 10 minutes or so, let it soak, and then it should blend a little bit easier. So right now we're going to be going for um, the consistency that we saw on screen, very whipped and creamy. This is pretty thick still. You want to think about the henna that you can use has to be the clump free parts. So you want as much as possible to get rid of those clumps. I'm adding a little bit of sugar because I want it just a little bit stickier, still not the whole bag, but I want it to um, get just a little bit creamier. So I'm adding a little bit of sugar to it. Um, it's getting closer. We're almost there with it. There's still some clumps. So I'm just going to keep on, keep on. Mix, mix, mix. Yeah. Still pretty thick. Um, again, the henna that you get to use is what's left over after you've strained out the clumps. So you want it as smooth as possible without being runny. Still keep adding very small amounts of water. Um, you'd be surprised a few drops can make a big difference in the consistency. See how much smoother that is? Barely added any at that point. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. That's about what we want. Um, you can pick it up and kind of drizzle it. You want it to kind of move just slightly. Like if you look at it really closely, it kind of settles melts a little bit it looks like um, but if it's melting too much that's that's too much water um, and that will make it a little bit runnier you can still use it um, but if it gets too runny and it's very liquidy then you might need another kit um, but uh, let me know if that's the case and we'll troubleshoot and talk it through so you're going to grab a glass a tall glass is recommended but short glass is fine um, y'all have just a little bit less paste in your kits than I do. Um, so short glass is fine. This is our carrot bag. It's like a giant icing bag. People use these to decorate cakes. The cones are just a smaller version of this basically, but I fold the bottom so that it can stand up more like upright, I guess. 
um, and said that the largest part of the bag is available to me to dump this henna into. Um, that tip is not going to help me out much. It's not going to hold much. So I just fold it up so I can use the bigger part of the bag to fill. So once this is flipped over the top of my rim, very comfortable, ready to receive some henna, I take the stocking and I stretch it across the opening. Now y'all's sock is just a little bit smaller than this. I made mine extra long so that y'all can see clearly what I'm doing. But you'll just stretch it across the top of the glass. It's like these pint glasses, they kind of go out at the top so it really holds it on there. Um, but if you are worried about it popping off, which is a concern for sure, um, with the short socks I definitely recommend using a hair tie if you have one or rubber band. I just put it on the top that's going to keep it from falling down with the gravity and the weight of the henna once you start to dump it in there. Um, so that's just a good way to keep it nice and secure. You don't want the stocking falling down into the henna because that's going to get messy. So at all costs try to keep the top of your carrot bag and the top of the stocking away from the henna. Um, so we're scooping it in there. Ooh, it's so creamy. Looks good. Kind of sticky. Mm -hmm. That's going to make for some nice rope laying later. And I'll explain that technique to you guys. For the bottom of the bowl, I try to scrape as much as humanly possible out. And that's because you will lose henna. In the bowl, you'll lose a little bit um, in the stocking when you pull out the clumps. And you'll lose a little bit when you're putting your cones together, filling them and testing them, testing the tips. Um, plus, you're going to do some practice drills. So you just want to make sure that you use every possible drop of henna that you can. You can scrape every part of that bowl out, even the clumpy bits, because you still can get some silky goodness out of there. Um, but yeah, I just take a piece of cardstock and it gives you a nice flat edge and a little better tool to scrape than a spoon. Um, so that's a good way to clean out. That's a whole lot of henna still left in my bowl there. Um, but since this is a demo, <laughs> it's not going to be exactly the way I normally do it. Um, that's good enough. Full here. Looks good. So very, very carefully grab the stocking and make sure it's not going to flop off and remove the rubber band. Then grab the stocking top. And I start with one side, then the other, and I grab both the, the carrot bag and the stocking. So they're together. So they're away from the henna, they're at the top together, they're clean. And then together, I pull those out of the bag, kind of shake, shake, gets it into the bottom there, and pull it on out of that glass and lay it down. And don't let go of the top. That will get very messy very fast. Um, but before you want to squeeze all of that henna into there, cut the tip of your carrot bag. A tiny bit, no big deal, teeny tiny little portion. This just allows airflow so that the henna will fill up the bag easily. If that was closed, you'd be fighting the air pressure that's in the bag. Um, so very carefully here, you're going to pull out just the stocking top. And then you're going to squeeze your hand around the top of the carrot bag or the icing bag and squeeze. This is your filter for all of your clumps. So you're just going to kind of pull the stocking out and squeeze your hand. You can even pulse it a little bit. It'll be almost like, um, I guess, maybe milking a cow a little bit. You're kind of squeezing and pulling, um, and you're kind of pulling down just a little bit. Um, and you can see the henna is filling up the bag nicely. All of that henna is silky smooth with zero clumps. So here I'm just trying to get the last little bit out of the stocking and minimize clumps. So there's all my clumps. Not bad. Not very many. Those will do me no good after this to the side and I'll wash out that stocking later and use it again. So very carefully take the carrot bag, make sure you fold it over the top very carefully multiple times and hold it steadily in your hand. I put the tip up. You're going to want to fight gravity just a little bit with this guy because if you hold it upright with the tip down, it's all going to start flowing out. So hold it upright to fill your cones in. And I just grab the empty cone and set it onto the tip of the carrot bag. 
and then I give it some squeezes. Since the hole is open at the bottom of our cone, we're not going to worry about having to snip it just yet. We'll do it later, but that's how you fill the cone. I recommend not even filling them as much as I am. If you see, I've left quite a bit of plastic at the top, and that is so I have room to fold it over several times. You're going to want to fold it at least four times before you tape it, um, and that's just going to help the pressure and keep it from exploding out of the pin cone. So again, I'm just going to fill all four of these for you guys real quick so you all can kind of just get a really good look at what I'm trying to do here. I fill it all the way up and squeeze it down to the tip, and then I just start to fill up the top until it's full enough for me. Um, and I usually just leave my fingers at the top where I want it to stop, give it a good squeeze, using the wetness of the henna to kind of temporarily close the top so that it doesn't start flowing out. If your henna is a little bit more runny than mine, you can stand these upright in that glass that you used originally, and then you won't have to worry about the henna flowing out of the tops. I try to keep the henna a good distance from the top because, again, if there's henna there, it's going to be very messy and very difficult to tape. And here you can see this is how much henna I have left. I'm pushing the ends in and trying to keep air out so I can see how much I have left. Almost a whole cone. That's awesome. So I'm going to put that in the freezer and then I'll thaw that out later and use it in a fresh cone when I am ready um, after I've gone through these guys. So I'm going to tape up one of these real quick for you. Um, and I have, I think, gratuitous video somewhere of taping and testing all four of the cones. Um, but I can throw that up later if you guys have questions towards the end. So take your tape. I try to go with where the lowest part of the opening is and put my tape across it. I'm trying to just make it all level at the top so I can flatten it like this. Press the tape in. That's a preliminary seal. It's not enough to hold the henna in. So I'm going to fold once, fold twice, fold again, and at least one more time, if not two. And that gives me a nice sense of pressure. My henna cone is completely henna. There's no air. There's no extra space. And then I'm taping it very securely. And keep holding it while you tape it because it might pop open. But put it across, put it over, put it several directions probably five pieces of tape at least. Um, and that's just to make sure it's really secure. If you lose pressure, your cone will stop working. So if you are henna in your skin later and you find that the henna won't come out, you might need to just add more tape to the top. Check for a leak. Um, see how you're squeezing it, if it's coming out the sides or something. But that's how it should look. And then to test your cone, or to test the tip, I squeeze out a little extra so that it's not just flowing out gratuitously. Um, and then I snip straight across just to make a nice clean flat edge. And then I will squeeze lightly to try to get a nice flow coming out. That's pretty good flow. Nice and easy. I'm barely squeezing at all. And then give it a couple of lines to test it. This is what you really want to test for is nice clean lines. And notice that I'm not touching the paper towel. I'm floating above it and squeezing and flowing. And that's something I'll show you guys in a little bit. But there you go. That's the deal. That's what it should look like. Good job. All right. So that is how you fill your cones. And um, this little video right here I'm going to show you guys is just more of the same. Um, if you don't want your henna cones laying down, you can set them in a container like this. You can use that glass that we used originally um, to strain the henna. Um, but I like just having like a little tin cup or something nearby to keep them upright. Um, and I'm just going to show you this technique a couple more times, just how to tape and um, how to make sure that your top is very secure. Um, I try to lay that across the lowest part of the cone so that I can close it up and give it an initial seal. This is not enough of a seal for sure. You definitely want to fold it down a few times and then tape it with several pieces of tape. 
Um, and I usually just go back and forth, back and forth, and fold it down as many times as I can to get it nice and tight so that the pressure stays really um, nice and full. That way the henna flows out very easily. And if you notice, this is why I have the paper towels down below me. Um, the henna is dripping out of the end as I'm applying pressure, and that will definitely happen while you tape these guys. So be sure that you are trying to keep as tidy as possible. Lay down some plastic or some paper. Um, paper towels work great, I think. I usually use rags that I can wash. Um, just cuts down on my waist. Um, but that just, you know, you're going to make a mess on this part while you're trying to figure out how to get it to flow properly um, so just be prepared for a mess um, and just keep snipping the tip here you can see it's kind of curling out of the tip you don't really want that you want to keep snipping it just a little bit more to try to get it to flow out in a straight line um, but once you also touch it down to your skin or to the paper towel it will start to come out on its own because it's nice and sticky um, so yeah, y'all can watch that part a few times if you like, um, but I think we're ready to move on to the building blocks of henna. Um, I'm going to show you guys, this is henna basics. Um, you'll see these same elements over and over again in many different kinds of henna and Mindy designs. Um, this is just a small little layout of some of the elements I use and how I like to put them together. On the left side is just various simple elements done different ways. I've got thin lines and thicker lines. I've got several humps, rows of humps, um, different sizes and thicknesses. Dots and circles are always fun. Um, plus, swirlies and vines are kind of my fave. Um, so I use those a lot. And um, you can see different petal shapes too. Since I do a lot of flowers, I like to change the shape of the petals that I use and that will just add interest to my design. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys another pre-recorded video real quick. Um, and this is just going to show you how to um, do these, how to actually lay out these simple designs and run drills. So. All right, so now I'm going to show you guys how to apply the henna. Now that your cones are taped securely and the tips are clear, it's time to practice some drills. Um, I usually start out with a few simple lines. And the technique I'm using here is called laying ropes. I'm hovering above the paper towel and I'm squeezing out the henna and I'm moving at a consistent rate to try to make a nice consistent line. I usually do a few of these, again, just floating above the paper towel and trying to build my speed just a little bit and keep that same consistent pressure. There we go, there's a fast one. And this one I think is about the right pace. Nice thickness, looks pretty good to me. Um, so that's a, enough lines for me to kind of get a little warmed up. Um, here I'm showing you guys how you can squeeze a little bit harder and go right next to that same line and thicken it up. What makes for really good and interesting henna designs is the variation of line work. Um, negative space and filled space, and then thickness and thinness of line work. Um, You'll see this in really intricate bridal designs from India, especially. Um, they do a beautiful job of using one cone and pressure to create really just in-depth designs. Definitely go look those up. Here I'm doing my favorite element, dots. Uh, I love these. They're so cute in henna designs. Plus they help you fudge if your line is not exactly straight, which is nice. Uh, the dots will guide the eye along so it looks like it's a little bit straighter than it actually might have turned out originally. And for this next line, I want to show you guys a very traditional building block. Um, you saw these on the screen before. Um, these little humps are pretty traditional for Indian designs. You'll see this in a lot of Indian design work, especially for bridal. Um, they're used for lots of fill, um, for bracelets, for wrapping elements. Um, you'll see different versions of them, thin and skinny, short and fat, stacked on each other. Um, it's a really interesting element and it's really versatile. So definitely practice a few lines of these, practice a few different sizes and thicknesses. 
I'm going to drop down and show you guys a wider version of this. But definitely practice. I like to practice on paper towels or paper first, um, but that just helps me to warm up and, and feel confident when I go over to work on my skin. Um, any henna that you lay down on your skin, if you mess it up, it's no big deal. But you do want to go ahead and remove it right away. If you leave it on even a minute, you will get a stain that lasts a few days in whatever design. So definitely run some drills before you start. Um, if you're feeling confident, go for it. Dive on in. But um, this is a nice way to just kind of work out your ideas and figure out what elements you like. There are lots of design sheets out there. If you look on Pinterest and the internet, you will find a lot of um, basic beginner henna elements. Um, and you can do a search on any of those words or phrases um, together and find some pretty good little practice elements. Um, and just do rows and rows of those um, just to kind of build up your knowledge about henna elements. Um, and then here I'm going to show you how I pair these. This is just my personal preference. I do a lot of flowers, botanicals. So I usually start with this as my base. In my paintings, I like to use a spiral at the center of most of my paintings. Some dots, because I love dots. And you see me going across the center from each dot, and that's to try to maintain balance. I'm going to show you this technique. Um, it's called compassing. Um, in a couple of frames, I'm going to show you guys a better way to do this and to keep your designs nice and clean. Um, but here I was going across the center from the first little hump that I made there. And that's just to kind of make sure that those are both end up the same size. You don't want to go all the way around a flower and figure out that your petals got smaller as you went along. So this is a way to keep it nice and consistent. And then, of course, I like these little teardrop shaped petals. I use these a lot. Um, little lotus petals is what we're most people refer to them as. There are lots of different petal shapes you can use, and I definitely encourage you to play with different shapes and see how the designs vary. It's really fascinating how just a few lines can make a huge difference in your design. But yeah, that's just a simple pairing of the elements we just practiced. Um, I didn't do any swirlies with it, but that's kind of the gist of how to take those elements and apply them. I'm going to show you guys a little vine technique, and this is this is more to do with pressure. Um, so with lines, I'm doing consistent squeezing and moving. Um, but to create specific elements, I can use pressure to do one stroke designs um, that leave a very interesting pattern. So here I'm squeezing out a dot. And then I stop squeezing and I drag the tail toward the line. And that creates a nice little vine element. Um, again, squeezing, I stop squeezing and I drag. And that connects with the line. And it looks really cool. I actually li I like to use those in circles around the center of my mandalas. They look really pretty. Um, on the other side, I'm going to show you the opposite of this. I am going to squeeze next to the line. Then I will stop squeezing and drag out away from the line. And that's going to create more of a leaf in this little whatever that is on the other side. <laughs> yeah, squeezing a dot, I stop squeezing and I drag. And you can do this very slowly to control how the tip of your leaf ends up. Um, or you can try to do a bunch of fast ones. It's kind of just fun to play with it and see what, see what happens. You can only really learn by doing, so do a lot. Um, definitely practice a lot of these ideas. So that's fine work. And I want to show you guys a quick little paisley. People really like paisleys, and that's a very recognizable um, signature element from Indian henna. You'll see this in a lot of tapestries and a lot of mandala patterns. Um, there are lots of different ways to do this, but this is just another way to wrap your elements in a different shape 
um, that's not as symmetrical as the flowers. Again, using those little humps to create a nice little border, keeping that consistent shape keeps that outside um, the same shape. And here I'm going to show you guys the compassing technique. So this is a good way to keep your designs balanced on the skin. Sometimes it's hard to tell exactly where the center of a hand is or um, if you're trying to place something on the shoulder, um, but make sure that it goes straight down the arm. I draw these thin little sketchy lines. These are thin enough that they're not going to stain your skin. They might leave a teeny tiny stain, but it will be gone in a day or two. Um, so very gently I'm squeezing and dragging that across the skin to find the center. And now I have these nice little orientation lines that can help keep me balanced. So starting at the center, I can kind of keep the shape a little bit better with my eye as I go around. And then I'm going to start on one side of the flower and then I go right across from it and I'm dragging my point out to that orientation line. That's going to make sure that each of these petals stays balanced and points out in the proper direction. And then I just have to make sure that the bottom is the right size. So I'm going here, then I'm going right next to it to fill in. That looks pretty good. It's a little bit more flowy than the other one because I'm doing this. But it's still pretty well balanced and all of those petals ended up a very similar size. So that was pretty successful. I'm gonna show you guys one more time because why not? And making those orientation lines, just crosshairs, and then diagonal and diagonal again. And with this one, I'm just gonna start with a little swirl because I love swirls. And I'm going to keep that sort of round shape um, rather than going straight into the petals with this one. I'm going to show you guys how to go between the lines um, and keep that orientation still. So starting out with my usual humps. I think this is how I border the center of most of my designs. It's just a comfortable place for me. You'll figure out what you like and what your signature styling is um, once you practice a few things. So there I'm going between the lines, filling in that V space with the hump instead and going right across the center to the other side to make sure that's the similar shape and size to the one I left behind. Yeah, and you can kind of see it's nice and rounded. The whole design ended up balanced and all of those circles look pretty consistent. And then I'm going to use the center of each of those larger humps to create my petals. Again, going across the center of the design to balance it on the other side and to make sure that all those petals get pulled out to the same place. So here I don't need the orientation lines. I'm building on the elements I just laid down. Again, just a nice way to keep everything very consistent. Look how nice. Ta-da! And look, we only used this much henna for all of that practice. All right. Do try to hold still. Sometimes I have to hold my breath when I'm doing my designs on myself. If you've got a buddy at home, you can try henna -ing on their skin. <laughs> it might be a little easier. Um, or you can just go really slow and do it on yourself. I really like to do henna on myself as a special treat when I have time, uh, kind of as a self-love moment, just a chance to pamper myself and smell the nice oils. And um, when you're done doing your design, you actually have to let it dry for 15 to 20 minutes. So you have to sit still a while. And um, that's just something we don't do very often. We're always running around. So henna gives me a chance to sit still and be patient. I'm trying to show you guys thick lines and thin lines here. Just for a little bit of interest. I love this little flower shape. I don't use it much. But it's a good one for the palm. 
Speaking of palms, the palms of your hands and the bottom of your feet are both the, the places on the body that will achieve the darkest stain. Um, it is because the skin is so thick there that the layers, um, when they're together, the skin, the stain looks really dark. Um, everywhere else, you'll get a pretty good stain. The top of the hands and tops of the feet is going to be the next best area. If you put henna on your shoulders, on your chest, on your tummy, on your thighs, um, all of those places are going to get lighter stains. And that's because the skin is thinner in those places. It hasn't been roughed up as much by the world around us um, and the wear and tear of years. So, um, so yeah. I went for a palm stain here just because I wanted to show you guys the development of a stain over a couple of days before class. Um, so this was just a quick and easy. I have suggested to you guys, I forget if it's a later panel or an earlier one at this point, but you want to leave the paste on a while. And um, the longer you leave it on, the deeper your stain will be and the longer you will have it. I wanted to show you how quickly it takes a stain also. I had this on for five minutes and I've already got a bright orange stain, which is gorgeous, it's fantastic. That's exactly what you want it to look like when you remove the paste. It starts out bright orange. The next day it'll be a light brown, which I'll show you guys. And um, then the second day after about 48 hours, it's even darker. Um, and this is, again, I left this on for five minutes, guys. So you will get a stain if it's on your skin for longer than a minute. Um, how long it's on your skin is contingent upon when you remove the paste. Um, also, you want to avoid water, and that's because water will also shorten the lifespan of your henna stain. All right, so there you go. That's how to apply henna stains um, or henna paste to create henna stains. And I do want to flip on the camera real quick and show you guys um, how that stain turned out so far. I did not leave it on, again, maybe five minutes and scratched it off. And uh, that created um, enough stain to get this dark. So yeah, while this um, did show up nicely and is dark, it won't last very long. So how long you leave the paste on really does determine how great your um, stain turns out and comes in. I do recommend leaving on the maximum amount of time as long as that is. Um, once it dries up and starts to flake off, you can pretty much just scratch it off at that point. Um, but do definitely try to leave it on as long as you possibly can just because um, if you're going to put all that work in and sit there for a long time and create a design you want to be able to enjoy it for a long time um, so I do want to go over real quick just some best practices um, just some kind of pro tips and some other little pointers about the things that we have discussed um, so in this little picture here you can see the different stages of the henna like we talked about earlier the powder, the fresh, um, mixed up with the essential oils and the sugar and the water, um, and then fully terped after six hours. Now, I do want to bring up one point, and that is that a lot of artists use lemon juice to make their paste flow rather than water. The reason that I don't is, um, first of all, I do large events, so I'm trying to make my henna as available to everyone as possible. So I try to minimize the allergy possibilities. Um, and some people have fruit allergies. So I do try to stay away from lemon juice unless it's specifically for a client or for myself. Um, but do know that it takes 24 hours for the henna to be ready if you use lemon juice. It takes a little bit longer um, for the for the um, dye molecule to be released. It's a beautiful rich stain um, it smells fantastic but that's why I use water also because it is much faster um, from mixture to ready to apply. 
Um, next to this, I have a picture of one of my designs that I was playing around with. I did want to just kind of stress again to look up designs and see how artists put their elements together um, and to play with thin lines, thick lines, empty spaces, filled spaces. Um, it's just a really fun thing to kind of play around with and can really affect the design that you come up with. Um, in the blue terping, which I refer to in the picture there, terping is actually the name for the dye release that occurs when the oils interact. Um, so that is what I mean when I say the henna has terped um, because the oils that do that um, chemical process are known as monoterpenes. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I've probably mentioned that word maybe once or twice throughout the stream. I try to keep everything simple and make sure I explain everything. But if you guys have any questions or there seems to be any gaps, um, I recorded these things probably 20 different times at this point. So I'm hoping that I'm covering everything. But if I leave something out, please ask me. Um, and even beyond the stream, you can always get in touch with your questions. I answer questions all day long, every day, it seems. Um, and I'm happy to do that. Um, so yeah, so best stains. This is probably the number one question. How do I get... The darkest stains that last the longest. Here is your uh, little short list of best practices. Apply the henna paste to clean skin. You want to make sure you have no lotion or sunscreen on your skin before you apply the henna to it. And that's because that water-based um, product will create a barrier for your henna and it just won't be able to seep down and saturate your skin like it would if your skin was a bit drier. Um, henna loves dry skin for sure. Um, make sure that when you do apply it, when you go to all the effort of creating this fantastic design, that you let it fully dry before you try to move. Part of the joy of henna is that you have to enjoy it and sit still for a while and do nothing else. Um, so take advantage of that. Put on some hot coffee or tea, put on some music, and just sit there. Um, I like to just sit there and enjoy the scent of the henna and relax for a moment. Um, but once it has dried, you should be able to move around freely, trying to leave the paste on for 2 to 12 hours. Now, the sugar that we added to the mix is what makes it sticky. But if you need to add a little extra stickiness at this point, once it's applied, um, you can put water and sugar in a spray bottle in like a 50-50 ratio um, and spray your design very lightly. If you get it wet and drippy, you will have runny stains, but if you spritz it a couple of times to make it sticky, it will stick to your skin a little longer. And then you can use coconut oil to um, get that stickiness off of your skin because you'll want to avoid water. Um, <clears throat> so after your stain, or after your paste has dried, after you've left it on as long as possible, um, you're going to scratch it off with your nails. Don't wash it off and don't wipe it off. Use your nails or a credit card or sometimes you can just rub really fast and it'll go flying off. I suggest doing that over a trash can or outside because, oof, super messy. And yes, you can sleep in the dried henna, but do expect to wake up with a few extra freckles on your body. Um, so once you have scratched off the paste, try to avoid water for 24 hours from the time you applied your henna paste. This is going to give that dye molecule a chance to develop and oxidize on your skin and to deepen and saturate. Um, so if you end up washing your hand an hour after you've removed your paste, it's going to wash off a lot of that development potential. Um, so you'll, your stain will be very light and it won't last that long. So if you can avoid water, you'll have a really dark, deep stain. Now it does take two hours. I think I might have mentioned it somewhere at this point. Um, the first day it is orange, the next day it is light brown, and the second day after application, you have a deep, dark brown stain. Again, this will vary on everybody. It has to do with cell turnover rate and how wet your skin is, how oily, um, what kind of lotion you might have had on your skin before. Um, there are a variety of factors, um, but that's probably your best set of tips for aftercare. Um, good aftercare equals good stains. So do try to adhere to that specific list as closely as possible. A few extra pointers just from Warren Pro to uh, a class of hungry learners. Um, there are a few ways that you can make sure that your stain lasts well. And there's a couple things you can do to get rid of your stain once you are ready for that. 
there is no removing your stain. Um, if it's been on your skin for five minutes, you're going to have a stain for a few days. So don't try to rub it off the day of. That can really tear up your skin um, and it's not a good way to take care of yourself. Um, so just be gentle with it. Um, to develop your skin, I'm sorry, to develop your stain deeply, you want to stay warm. Um, but not hot or sweaty because again, that wetness will lead to not a great stain or to a runny stain. Um, leaving the paste on longer does mean a darker stain that you'll have for a longer time and it will have a more consistent fade if you leave it on a long time. So I try to leave mine on at least two hours up to six hours if I can. Um, I hardly ever make it past six hours because I just I have stuff to do with my hands. Um, <laughs> when you do actually wash the area, um, make sure that you're not soaking in water like a bathtub or a pool. Um, and when you are drying off, pat the area dry. Do not rub because rubbing is friction and exfoliation, and that's going to pull some of your stain off. Um, try not to exfoliate the area until your design is fading. Um, again, it will, fading is a gradual process, um, but you can apply lotion and soak and do kind of the opposite of good aftercare um, to fade down your stain sooner. It will still take several days to get rid of any stain that you have. Um, depending on how long you've had it on for. Um, and you can always use coconut oil. I use coconut oil instead of lotion because it doesn't bust up the stain. And if I slather on a little bit before I do get in the shower that first time, it will repel the water off a bit and protect my stain. So there you go. Kind of an earful, but lots of good tips and tricks for you guys. I totally encourage you guys to go learn more about this subject. I have, again, been at this years, and I feel like I am an amateur. <laughs> There's so much information. There are so many different places um, that have artists that do this work. Um, there is so much out there to absorb on this subject. So if you're into it, please go digging. Um, and double check your information. You always want to make sure you're getting accurate information from the internet, so check multiple sources. Um, you can look up other natural henna artists by using natural henna artist hashtags, such as hashtag natural henna, hashtag natural henna art, hashtag henna is only brown, or hashtag henna is never black. Um, and we can have a, a chat about that sometime if you want black henna, instant henna, chemical henna, um, that dangerous stuff. I don't touch it. I don't use it. I don't recommend it. Um, this is the good stuff. This is how the ancients did it. And you can see the stains are just beautiful. They're so natural and they're so lovely. And they look so different and personalized in each person. Um, so definitely go learn some more about the deep history and rich cultures surrounding the use of henna. Um, and if you are really, really into this, like I was the first time I sat down with it, um, there are a few things I would recommend to you if you want to go pro. First off, maybe number one, maybe the only thing that really needs to be on this list, practice. You cannot fake practice. You cannot sit down two times and do henna and start charging money for it. You cannot book high paying gigs and show up with amateur skills. So if you are going to ask for money or pursue this as a career or learn about the history of it um, and the elements that create the designs and patterns, practice them. Know them backwards and forwards. Practice, practice, practice with some practice on top of your practice. Um, I can't stress that enough. You have to build up the muscles that do this um, if you're going to do it a lot. And some of my gigs have run as long as 12 hours before. Um, and that is a long time to not have a break. Um, and I could not have done that if I had not practiced beforehand. Um, I would also highly recommend that you learn everything that you can. The natural henna artist community across the globe takes a lot of pride in being educated on the subject and we teach each other. Um, we connect our community and we try to learn from each other, not just with traditions and cultures behind the use of henna, um, as, but also best practices and how to deal with clients, how to price your work, um, all those things. You can find your community and learn from them. Um, so that responsibility falls to you, I feel like, um, to educate yourself and be knowledgeable. Um, because you can't be the expert if you're still asking amateur questions. Um, so if you're still asking questions, you're not quite ready to go pro yet. And that's fine. It's a journey. Take some time. Um, but yeah, definitely educate yourself. Take that into your own hands. Um, when I say learn from others, I don't just mean business practices or um, 
how they apply their henna, but also do practice other people's designs. Do not take credit for those designs as if they are your own. Um, it is really big and encouraged in the community to credit other artists you are inspired by. It's actually one of the things I love about the community. People um, will make sure that people are held accountable to, hey, isn't that so-and-so's design? Or, hey, can you do this? And that's because you don't want to ever slip into um, the space of false advertising. You don't want to show somebody a picture of really elaborate henna that you've never done before. Um, or if somebody comes to you with a picture of something, you don't want to say, yeah, I can do that without ever actually practicing that. Um, design by that other artist. So learn from others so that you can understand how this art is put together. Um, learn from lots of different artists, lots of different styles, and that will help you grow exponentially. Um, but do always make sure that you are creating your own work if you're claiming it as your own and that you are giving credit and shout outs to other henna artists if you use their designs as inspiration. I, I think everybody really loves that. I love to see myself tagged by somebody in Australia who liked a design that I did and was like, hey, inspired by whimsy. Um, so that's just a good practice in general to be a good member of your community. Um, and lastly, I would say support other artists when you buy supplies. Don't buy from Amazon or eBay. Buy directly from natural henna artists. And you can usually tell the good ones because they are very transparent on their websites. They talk about natural henna. They talk about fresh henna. They have to ship the henna to you inside of two days if it's already mixed because henna goes bad. Y'all are making it fresh and you're seeing that there are no um, preservatives in there. So when you are done with your henna, do make sure that you stash it in the freezer. Um, if you're going to use it later today, the fridge is fine so that you don't have to sit there for it to thaw out. Um, but I definitely recommend um, putting them in the freezer because they just stay so much fresher that way. And you can put them in the freezer and take them out multiple times for months before they stop really giving you a great stain. Um, so yeah, um, I think that about covers it. So I'm going to leave you guys with this last video and um, open the floor up. If anybody's out there and wants to ask me a question, I'm gonna hang out till the end of this video. And um, if I don't see any questions, I'm just gonna probably boogie on out after that. Um, but uh, feel free to contact me. I think I put some links in my description or told you where to find me. You can subscribe to my channel and follow the rabbit hole back to my Facebook page and Instagram and website. Um, but yeah, let me throw this video up for you guys because this is probably another question that's asked pretty often is how do I make these henna cones? And yes, I do make them by hand. I made all of yours myself. Um, when I teach classes at the libraries, um, usually it's to teenagers, usually 25 at a time. And I give them not only a henna cone, but a practice cone as well, which is filled with lotion. And that's another little pro tip for you guys if you want to practice, but you don't wanna waste your henna is you can watch this video and see how I roll my henna cones. You can try it. And then you can fill those cones with lotion instead of henna. And that is something you can apply to your skin that won't stain you. Um, it doesn't make nearly the mess that henna does. Um, and I think it's just honestly a very fun tool. I use henna cones for many things. Um, namely, if y'all have seen my artwork and my paintings before, you know that I use paint in the cones more often than I do henna at this point. I do so many paintings and I have rolled hundreds of henna cones at this point between classes and the artwork that I do. Um, but I really like putting paint in the cones. It gives a nice 3D effect, um, but it definitely takes a lot of muscle memory and practice to get to the point where you can do it on canvas in one stroke. Um, but yeah, E6000 is also another excellent thing to put in these henna cones. Uh, I don't know if y'all have ever messed with E6000, but it is the worst glue ever. Strongest glue, amazing craft glue, perfect for crafts and for attaching things to clothing and to crowns. However, it just flows endlessly out of the bottle and makes a huge mess and then dries and clogs and yeah, it stresses me out. So I use... E6000, just enough for whatever project I have on deck in the um, henna cones. And that gives me a nice 
small tip for control and also I don't dry out the whole bottle with glue um, and I make a lot less of a mess which is always great in my studio because I am a mess maker by profession <laughs> it's kind of my job um, so when I can cut down on the mess that's a good day um, but here you can see that I am folding it over um, into a triangle I'm holding the tip at one end and just kind of rolling it over and over. I stick my thumb inside to hold it in place and I grab a T-pin. And this is used on dress shirts. Most often is where you see them when you dry, buy a new dress shirt. This is holding it nicely together so it looks very um, clean and tidy. And I stick this in the end of the cone while I tape it. And just while I'm taping the opening, um, I kind of stick it just a little bit past the tip of the cone actually because I'm going to snip these later like I did in the earlier video. But that's the henna cone and then I'm going to take uh, the tape and seal up the rest of the seam. So anywhere where the edge is right there, I'm going to go up there and tape that all down for um, to control the pressure. And then I'm going to go around, um, there's a little bit left that swirls up around the rest of the cone, and I'm going to tape that down as well. Henna cones don't really need this much tape, but I'm so used to doing paint cones, um, and those do require a lot of tape. Um, it's kind of just my default setting now, so I tape these suckers to death. Um, but yeah, you just don't want your henna cone busting open. It is quite tragic when you have your henna paste um, stop flowing out of the cone and then suddenly burst out of the side of your cone. Um, it's quite the situation um, and definitely not the kind of stain you were looking for design-wise. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to show you this one again. And just peeping at comments, but I don't really see anybody kind of interacting. I think people are going to come back to this video later. It's a gorgeous day. I hope people are outside. Um, but if you were here, if you've joined me at all, I do want to thank you for coming and supporting local art during this tumultuous time in the world. Um, you can always find more of my videos on this channel right here. I'm trying to do some more slowed down versions so that you guys can just chill out. But I do have a lot of time lapse ones as well, just because people find those very fascinating. Um, yeah, subscribe to my channel. Follow me on Instagram. Um, I usually stream to Twitch instead of YouTube, but sometimes I will do simultaneous streams these days. I typically don't use a microphone. This is, in fact, my first video ever with a microphone. And, um, yeah, I hate it, but <laughs> it is um, a nice shortcut when my hands are busy to be able to talk to you guys. <coughs> so I have enjoyed that aspect. And I will have other tutorials that I put out um, or pre-recorded videos for sure. It's pretty hard to do the live microphone, but um, for this kind of classroom setting, I did want to be available to you guys if y'all had questions as I go along. Um, but yeah, definitely take down my information. Definitely follow my website. Definitely find me on Instagram. I think my Instagram is more fascinating than my Facebook. You can find me on Facebook under my own name, um, but do know that I don't accept friend requests from everybody, but you're welcome to follow me. I post a lot of stuff to my Facebook, um, but it's not all art. It's mostly art and good vibes. All right. Well, I think that's going to be the end of that video, and um, I'm going to dip on out. Thank you again so much for coming. I hope you learned some things. I hope you're inspired. I hope you understand everything that I presented. I hope that I was clear. Um, if not, again, please, please track me down. Get in touch. Pick my brain. I don't mind. Um, I want the world to know about natural henna. I want you guys to be able to enjoy these kits. And for those of you who have not picked up kits yet, um, I do have y'all's left. And um, after that, I'm probably going to defer people to the professionals like hennacaravan.com where they have kits regularly and they put them together very nicely um, and they're just an awesome company anyway so go support them they definitely could use it and um, I'll see you guys with whatever the next video ends up being um, hope you'll have a, an excellent excellent rest of the day see y'all later <laughs>